Hello, everyone. Welcome to Book Soup Online. <laughs> uh, my name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a virtual event this evening with Noah Hawley discussing Anthem. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. Uh, we'll be hosting a lot more events in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at booksoup. We are still having online events, even though we're not having in-person events yet. So please come around and check us out. Um, support our bookstore and our author and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads Anthem directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. Um, we're also selling digital books, uh, digital audiobooks and eBooks through Libro.fm and Kobo for those who are interested. Um, Tonight's books will come signed, so I very much recommend that you get them while supplies last. If you'd like to ask a question during the event, please use the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen and type it in. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. So tonight, uh, let me tell you a little more about Noah. Uh, he's one of the most accomplished authors and versatile uh, storytellers working in television, film, and literature. Over the course of his more than 20 year career, his work as a novelist, screenwriter, series creator, showrunner, and director, that's a lot, <laughs> has garnered acclaim, winning an Emmy, Golden Globe, Edgar Penn, Critics' Choice, and Peabody Award. As a best-selling author, he has purchased, he has published five previous novels, um, The Conspiracy of Tall Men, Other People's Weddings, The Punch, The Good Father, and I'm sure you've all heard of it, Before the Fall. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Noah for a moment. Hey, thank you so much for having me to come here and uh, talk to you about the book. <laughs> thank you. It's wonderful to have you. Can you talk a little bit more about the title? Um, what did it come from? What does it mean in the context of the book? Well, the, there is in the very first chapter a moment in, in which... Um, you know, there, there is a, a kid's talent show, a school recital, basically, that all these parents have come to. And, and we meet one of our main characters who, who's a, a, a judge who's there with her husband from her second marriage. And, and um, you know, she was meant to help her daughter prepare something and she doesn't know. She knows her daughter's going to sing, but she doesn't know what she's going to sing. And then her daughter is first up and what she sings is the national anthem. And, um, you know, everybody in the crowd stands, some grudgingly, some ironically, some instantly, but, you know, for the judge who sits in front of a flag every day and, and, and for whom those totems are, are meaningful, you know, it, it, it's a very meaningful moment for her. And then of course the book jumps ahead in time to, you know, 15 years or so, and and the daughter is in a very different different place, and you know, there's this book sort of refers to different anthems of different kinds, um, but you know, there, I wanted for the title and and for the cover of the book something that felt expansive. You know, we all bring, we all bring our own emotion to that word. Um, and to the, you know, and, and the image on the, on the front of the book, which I think is, is really powerful. Um, you know, you just, you, you, you want to, I want a, an emotional reaction out of people. I, you know, there's a lot of clever titles out there. Um, and I always feel like if I'm just being clever, I'm not doing my job. So, um, yeah, it, it feels, it feels like a book that could be anything which which I like about it. I've heard you describe Anthem as a fantasy novel about the real world that we live in. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, and then I say, or it's a realistic novel about the fantasy world that we live in. Um, is it magical realism? Would you qualify it as that? I, I think I think certainly there is there are those qualities to it. You know, it's it's on a lot of levels, it's, it's an adventure story, you know, and, and a, has a kind of fantasy novel um, structure to it in, in that you have a group of uh, these young people who are on a quest basically to rescue this young woman from um, a man they call the wizard. Um, and 
but rather than going through to Mordor, they're 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 going to Texas and they're going to California and and you know and they're moving through our through our current American landscape and um, you know I, I refer in the book to the sort of two kingdoms the kingdom of Wall Street and the kingdom of Main Street and and you know very much representational of the sort of urban versus the rural divide the kingdom of Wall Street being a place described, you know, by one of the characters as, as, you know, a, a sort of, we believe in science in the kingdom of Wall Street and, and, you know, and, and the kingdom of Main Street being a, a more instinctual or emotional place where people argue that feelings are also facts. Um, and, and so, you know, for these characters to move sort of through both, both Americas on this quest, to um, to try to save this this young woman. You have a reputation for writing just beyond the cusp of either current events or understanding of the world that we're living in. Without no spoilers, how did that manifest itself in writing Anthem? Well, you know, I didn't. I set out to write a book about these people, and and in doing so, I had to think. Well, all right. Well, is it set today? Is it set in the past? Um, and I had this idea, you know, when you when you make television, you interact with the culture mostly in real time, right? You might be a few months behind, but a book you're talking about three years, five years it takes to write it. So I thought, well, I'd like for the reader to pick the book up and for it to feel contemporary. But then, you know, in 2018, 2019, I thought, okay, well, so if it's 2021 or 2022, what is America going to be like? You know, how do I write to that? And, and then, of course, that became a much bigger part of the book, which is thinking about, okay, well, where are we now and where are we going to be in, in two or three years? Um, and some of that was, you know, it's as much about looking to the past as it is looking to the future to say, okay, well, where, where did we start and, and where have we ended up? The idea of kind of like what you're saying, that you had to be somewhat prescient, uh, prescient about this what, at that time, because, you know, these, this, the idea of two kingdoms of the heart and of the mind seems so terribly relevant <laughs> to the last two years. Um, and I, I just want to know: Were you able to like make changes over that time? Did you make any like significant edits to your to your piece? And also, why did you choose to do it in? Um, sorry, why did you choose to write it in book form? Why not a screenplay? Um, you know, I remember watching. Um, I think it was the Republican convention in 2016, and Newt, Newt Gingrich was on cnn and and he said you know crime is up all over the country mm -hmm. and the journalist said no it's not it's down that's a fact and he said well people feel like it crime is up and that is also a fact and and i had a moment then and we were making fargo season three then which is very much about sort of truth and breaking down the idea of what a true story is and i thought something just changed in, in america this idea that your feeling is also a fact is is such um you know i don't know how to argue with that right how do you argue with that i mean crime is just it's not up and but you feel less safe um and so you know that is only increasingly true today right so but those moments were were there um in the past um, and so for me, it, it was, it was trying to think one or two steps ahead of where we were, you know, and I had to make choices, you know, I, I had to decide, okay, well, who's going to be the president in 2022, not specifically the candidate, but, you know, is the last guy going to still be president or is a new person going to come in? And, and, you know, I'm, I made a calculated risk to say that, that someone new was going to come in. And that what was going to happen when somebody new came in is that it, is that a lot of people were going to breathe a sigh of relief and and we're going to say, OK, well, everything's normal again now. But 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 that wasn't, you know, what do we know about Obi-Wan? Like the 
you strike him down, he only comes back stronger. So there is that undercurrent in the book, like just because you, you know, you can't see the shark doesn't mean you shouldn't, that you should feel safe. I know I just mixed two blockbuster movie metaphors, but. Um, it works. Eh, <laughs> um, and then why, why a book? I mean, there's, there's, you know, I make very ambitious, I, I tell very ambitious stories for the screen, but it felt like there was, there was too much in this. Um, you know, the, the power of, I, I always, there's always a lot of ideas and themes that go into my work for the screen. But if I do my job right, they're mostly invisible, right? You have mm -hmm. to figure out a way to turn um, ideas into story and, and, and drive them through character. And in this book, I guess I wanted to have a more adult conversation and, and to explore not just what happens in the book, but, but why, why the, this nation is, is the way that it is. Um, and some of that involved, you know, a, a, a more, a mixture of fiction and nonfiction, um, which, you know, I, I played with on the screen, but, but I just felt like I needed, I just needed more words. So there's, it's definitely, from what you're saying, it's definitely essayistic, even if it is fiction, and it's hard to, to put an essay on screen without it being rambling. I um, understand that. You were talking also, you mentioned adult conversations. Um, during the pandemic, you were also parenting. Um, how did parenthood influence your writing process, given that the main storyline features adolescence? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I had my my first kid 14 years ago and and it has become an increasing preoccupation of mine um artistically psychologically philosophically of like how how are they doing how is the world around them what what do i need to be teaching them who's watching out for them mm -hmm. you know and that you know i wrote the good father you know, I started it right after my daughter was born, you know, and, and it was very much a book about a, you know, a man who was trying to fix mistakes he'd made in his past, you know, with, with his, his son. And, um, you, you know, I, I look at Legion as a show very much, you know, I, I, I always pictured those, those characters on Legion as, as the kids from Peanuts all grown up, you know, like... <laughs> Um, and then this last season of Fargo, which was literally about the two crime bosses who trade their youngest sons. And you can tell who's a moral person by how they treat the children around them. So, you know, I, I think very much that informs my, my work and certainly with this book, um, you know, there's a question in that I ask in the book, which is you know, what skills do we need to teach our children to prosper in a country and in a world where reality itself is, can't be agreed upon, you know, like, it's not something you or I had to worry about when we were growing up, you yeah. know? Um, so yeah, it's on my mind. Um, it was a very different world. Um, did you do any of the writing for this book during the pandemic? And if you did, did it influence what you're writing? I know that you mentioned it's mostly 2018, 2019, but did the pandemic at all make its way into your writing? Well, it's it certainly, uh, I mean, I, the bulk of the book got written in, in 2020. Okay. Okay. Um, and last year was mostly production process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so Yes, we, we went into lockdown with this pandemic and, and, you know, the book sort of centers around a, a very contagious idea, you know, which is, which is suicide. Um, and the people that it infects the most is young, is young people. And so there's this sort of epidemic of, of suicides at the, at the beginning of the book that, that, um, you know, on many levels, these, these, um, these adolescents at the heart of the book go on this journey to try to, you know, save, save the world on, on, on some level. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, the pandemic, 
definitely exacerbated the the central issue of the book, which is anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 adolescent anxiety. And and there's a moment. And there's a character in the book. There's a 15 year old kid who calls himself the prophet, and you know, he talks at one point about. Um, fear, you know, you can motivate people through fear and you can motivate them through love and fear is easier. And, and, you know, we all know that Fox came, news came along and, and started scaring the shit out of people, you know, in, in the nineties. And, and then of course we had nine 11 and the, the sort of forever wars and, and, you know, and so those people who were, who, you know, who, who have spent the last 30 years watching Fox news and that culture, you know, those are our parents. Right. And so some of our parents, many of our parents. Well, I mean, yeah. from the point of view of the character, like those yeah. are our parents. And, you know, if you're going to be raised by people who are that afraid, it's of course you're going to be anxious. What do they expect? Um, and and so that level of anxiety that that the pandemic has has given to all of us, but as, but especially young people, um, definitely um resonated with what i was already writing so speaking of can you kind of talk more about time and how it works in anthem um there's a lot of skipping back and forth um is that a is that an idea that came to you while writing it or what did you plan to do that well i mean on some level it's it's um it's a product of character right mm -hmm. you know there there is um you know, there, there's sort of two godfathers of this book, I would say. One of them is, is Kurt Vonnegut and the other is Stephen King, you know. And, and if you look at a book like The like Stand, mm -hmm. you know, there's a sprawling cast of characters. And every time you switch, you know, you sort of need to catch up to the present moment. So you're often going back in time. And I think that's true Mm -hmm. of fantasy novels as well game of thrones you're you're always doing that which is like okay well now we've shifted to this character and now we have to go back and get them caught up to the to the present moment so you know there's there's there is some some degree of that in this in this story but i, I think that it, you know by a certain point it becomes contemporaneous storytelling there um but um yeah that's my answer you mentioned Stephen King and Kurt Vonnegut. Um, what who are some of the other influences um, that you had in mind when writing Anthem? And where do you see that influence in your writing? Well, so so this is a book in which there I myself, you know, talk to the reader. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm front and center, um, and it, it's a book that tells you know a sort of fantastical story um while at the same time being very grounded in in you know some very serious real world issues and you know and so when i thought about all these all these different types of storytelling you know i found myself thinking about slaughterhouse five mm -hmm. you know and and you know which was just kurt vonnegut trying to tell his own world war ii experience but he was going to fictionalize it. And to do so, he came up with a device in which his main character is, is, has come unstuck in time and he's jumping around in his, in his life, which is a science fiction conceit, you know, mm -hmm. and then he, and then he one ups that by at some point, his lead character is kidnapped by aliens and taken to another planet. Right. And, mm -hmm. and then Kurt Vonnegut himself is, is talking to the audience about his war experience and, and, you know, and, and all of these pieces should not work together. You know, there's cartoons in the book, like, but it all does work, work together. And in fact, it's one of the, it's one of the clearest and simplest moral documents, you know, ever, ever created. And, and so I thought, okay, well, I, you know, I have my own style and my own approach, but, but I did have the instinct that I didn't want to hide behind the story that I, I wanted to be out front of it and say, basically like, look, I'm worried, you're worried, 
let me tell you the story to try to tell you what I'm worried about and what the world is like. And maybe we can try to figure out why it is the way that it is and, and what we can do about it. And, you know, it's always just an experiment, you know, and I, I remain amazed that people will pay me money to, to experiment with what a story can be. Do you, you, you said that you wanted to be out in front telling the reader what's going on, but can you talk a little bit more about the perspectives of the children in your book? The, yeah, the I mean, you know, there's a moment where Simon, who's sort of our, our protagonist, um, you know, he comes from a very wealthy family and he has an older sister who, who killed herself. And that, you know, the day after she did it, her parents basically um, emptied her room out and turned it into like a gift wrapping room. And then they, and then they basically refused to talk about her, you know, and, and Simon was 13 or 14 when this happened. And, and, you know, he's supposed to pretend that his sister didn't exist or had never existed or something. And it was very traumatizing for him. And his parents took him on this trip and he, he found this book that was about climate change and he read it, you know, and all the facts that were in it. And he thought, do grownups know about this? Because obviously if grownups knew about this, they would be dropping everything to solve this problem that's gonna end all life on earth. And then he slowly began to realize, no, I think they do know about this. And I don't think they're doing anything about it really. And and that only added to his sense of, of anxiety, you know, and, 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 and so, you know, my son is nine. He asked me recently, you know, why do grownups get to decide everything? And I said, well, honestly, I don't know. We're not very good at it. And, and, you know, you have to listen to me, but, but, um, but, but it's really hard to say because we, you know, we do this thing as adults where we tell our children things are complicated, right? Mm -hmm. It's like gun violence is complicated and climate change is complicated. And, you know, and then you have a child, you have Greta Thunberg, you know, show up at the UN and say, it's not complicated. Either the planet heats up three degrees or it doesn't. It's one or the other. It's not complicated. And so I think there is that simple morality, that clarity that, that kids can have, you know, that we need. Um, it's terrifying and very true. Um, I think actually Aaron Spelling turned Tori Spelling's room into a gift wrapping room. <laughs> Unrelated, but that's interesting. Yes. There's two gift wrapping rooms. Yeah, um, it was a 12,000 square foot room and now it's oh. a gift wrapping room. <laughs> um, so how did writing this differ from writing for the screen? I know we talked a little bit about that before, but how is world building on the page different? Um, than it would be if you were a director or a showrunner? Well, I mean, it's, um, I mean, fiction is concerned primarily with, with interior states, right? Mm -hmm. You know, literature is an inside out medium. You know, you think about your favorite books and, and you, you're inside the heads of your characters and, and you get to action through, through thought and decisions. And it's why you so often hear authors say that they were surprised by the things their characters did in the book because they, they started out writing psychology and as they got through it, they found themselves at an action that made complete sense based on the psychology. But if you just said to them, make this character do something, they might not have made them do that particular thing. And so, you know, screenwriting on the other hand is you have, you have action and you have dialogue and that's all you have. Right. But that doesn't mean that that work, that interior work, isn't just as important to do there. And, you know, a lot of it is, is, um, you know, a lot of it in, in our modern network and studio world is about saying the quiet part out loud. Right. It, mm -hmm. I think that studio executives believe that if a character doesn't say it out loud, then how is the audience going to know that they're thinking it or feeling it, which is what acting is, right? And cinematography and, and all that. Um, but, you know, I learned, I learned early on to, you know, leave room for the, for the actors. Like, you know, you can write a very simple scene that can tell you so much, 
you know, because it's clear to the actors what the role is and, and, and what they're doing. You know, I, we did, I had a scene in the second season of Fargo um, for Jesse Plemons, his introductory scene, you know, he comes out of the back of the book butcher shop and he says, okay, then, and, you know, and the boss says, okay, then, and, and, you know, and then, and then somebody didn't pick up their meat. So he gets to take it home. And then, um, you know, I remember FX saying after they read the script, they're like, we feel like we really missed an opportunity to get to know him. And I was like, I think you get to know everything there is about him. Like he's a simple guy, like, it's very Midwestern. Yeah, Midwestern free, meat making, free meat makes him so happy, and and uh, <laughs> you know, so so I think it's all it's often about kind of fighting that battle, which is which is, um, well, that's not just people just don't say their truths out loud, you, you know, to yeah. everybody all the time. So, you know, and in fiction they don't have to. In fiction they they can think it and you can read it, and that makes it real. <clears throat> um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so what do you think the fans of Before the Fall will appreciate most about Anthem? Um, and what do you think your fans from TV, uh, kind of time back from TV and film, what do you think they're going to think about Anthem? Uh, that's a big ask. Um, I mean, you have to remember that Before the Fall, within 20 pages of Before the Fall, I was writing, I was telling you all about the life of Jack LaLanne, mm -hmm. right? And that there were there were these sort of nonfiction sections about John, John Jack LaLanne and, and how he started this exercise craze and how he had this mind over matter philosophy and and how it informed, you know, the lead character in that in that book. And and that that was also a book that was broken up structurally because it was built around a, a a plane crash in which you would have these you know basically short stories about everybody who was on that plane and what led them up to that day and so you know i found that to be a very structurally experimental book that that happened to to work as what people call a, a thriller um but you know from my mind was really a you know character driven story you know, and I, I always look at and anything, whether it's Fargo or Legion or Lucy in the Sky or the, or the books, and I go, okay, well, here's the story I want to tell, but how does the story want to be told? You mm -hmm. know, um, you know, Lucy in, in the Sky wanted to be a magic realism astronaut movie because the magic realism allowed me to really get to sort of visualize her psychology and her psychological decline, you know, and Fargo purports to be a, a true story, you know, so it wants to be rendered as objectively as possible, whereas Legion is a surreal show because you have a, a lead character who may be mentally ill and isn't sure what's real and what's not real. Um, and so, you know, all I do, all I did here was sort of have a story in my head and try to figure out how to tell it and, and you know, so, so even though each work might seem very different, there is a coherent um, approach to everything, you know, which is, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's never the same twice, but, but I think that there's a sensibility, there's a voice there that, um, you know, that you, you shouldn't mistake for anyone else. Basically, you know, um, when when I heard that they were going to make a series of one of my favorite movies, Fargo, I was like, oh, they're going to, you know, how, but that voice that you're talking about just carried it through. And it was even better than the film in many ways. So I understand, I understand what you're saying. That voice, you know, the voice stays the same where circumstances change. And that's so important in maintaining a series of any kind, especially with what you're writing. Um, and I want to know, is that voice... In anthem is it hopeful at all or not yeah i think it is i mean i i think if you look at um you know it's a very playful book and and the fact that these young people are are on this adventure if you look at their approach to problem solving um if you look at their attitude you know it's it's very um 
I mean, they're they're children. It's there's op, they're optimistic. They're not nihilists, you know. And and you know, and the book has that playfulness to it. You know, these these children that you know, one of the kids traveling with them calls himself the prophet, and he tells them that God talks to, to him, and they're on a mission from God, basically. And so, you know, when they steal an Amazon truck, they assume that God put that Amazon truck in front of them, and that everything in that truck is is there for the specific purpose of helping them and so you know there's a just there's a there's a playfulness to it that is not earnest or you know overly overly serious even though the book itself you know concerns a lot of serious things um would you consider the book to be something that would be could ever be considered ya or something that someone the age of those children could enjoy or understand or is it the audience meant to be, you know, 21 plus. I mean, I did not write it for a, for a younger audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have a 14 year old that I was just trying to figure out, you know, all of her friends are watching Euphoria. And I was like, I don't know, that seems kind of adult for 14, but I also know, no. And so I had to figure out, like, am I going to let her watch that or not watch that? And I, I finally landed on, well, I'll watch it and you'll watch it and we'll talk about it, you know, mm -hmm. because I, we always have an instinct to protect our kids from things, but I'm not sure that protecting them from things is, is always helpful to them. You know what I mean? So, you know, on some level, if you write a book about the, the, the sort of stickiness of the idea of suicide, among young people, the last person you want to read is as a young person. If you're, you know, if you're worried that they're impressionable or it's going to, you know, have an, a, a consequence that you didn't intend. But, you know, at the same time, given the way the world is right now, I mean, they, they got to grow up pretty quick in order to get in the game. What, what terrified me and struck me about this is that now child suicide is up because of the pandemic and, you know, mental health issues are worse than ever. Um, and I think that that was something that resonated. Maybe it didn't, it didn't obviously intend to resonate, but something that ultimately did. There was a fascinating moment a month ago or six weeks ago, there were these two articles in the New York times on the same day. And the, and the one was, they had done this long investigation. There's a website that, that is helping people kill themselves, right? You go to it, it's collected different ways that you can do it. There's a community of people there who can guide you or support you or, or, or whatever. Um, it's just a hugely cynical and sort of exploitative thing run by these two guys that, that were referred to as incel, you know, internet guys. And on the same day, there was an article about this 20 year old guy who started the birds aren't real meme. Do you know this meme? I've, yeah. There's so many that is. <laughs> well, it's basically the idea is that, you know, all birds have been replaced by these drones that are actually spying. Oh, on yeah. and, and, you know, and, and it became a very kind of popular meme. And then, he, you know, he, he was in the Times sort of admitting, no, it's satire, mm -hmm. of, you know, conspiratorial thinking. And I thought, well, that's the book in a nutshell, right? You have these very cynical, men a sort of pied piper who are luring these children in to their deaths and then you have the kids themselves who are responding with such inventiveness and and you know absurdity on some level that that only you know young young people are really capable of and and that really resonated with me as as sort of the heart of the book, which is like the the enemy is is this cynical exploitation. You know, it 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 is it is you know Jeffrey Epstein at, as as the kind of you know rock bottom version of it. But but it's still, I mean, it's it's you know it's politicians who have been vaccinated who are telling people not to get vaccinated. Right. It's like they know what the right answer is, but it's not a popular answer. So they don't say it. You yeah. know what I mean? It's it seems very cynical to me. Um, well, 
on that note, and speaking of community, I want everyone to take this time to write your questions. And for Noah, again, please um, write them in the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and I know that you're probably not allowed to answer it, but do you see this becoming a film or a television series? Well, I mean, what I'll, what I'll say is not, none of my books have become film or television series. Um, and I think on, on some level, you know, I, I have this luxury of being able to, to make film and television and, and, you know, I like the books to be books, you know, mm -hmm. um, that said, I, I do feel, you know, now you wake up one day and you've written six of them and there begins to become a body of work there. And, and I, I find myself excited by the idea of adaptation, I think in film or, or limited series. So, um, so I do feel like, you know, phase three of the, of the career could involve turning to, you know, two or three of the books and, and, you know, and this one especially feels very, you know, I important to me to, to examine. And also the most challenging one, you know, how do you translate this to the screen? You know, it's it's why I wanted to do Cat's Cradle as a limited series because how, how do you do Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut in two hours? It's it's very hard to tell the full story and still do all the stuff that makes it Kurt Vonnegut. You know, so um, but here it's a sort of similar thing. I can't really see how you would make a movie out of this. Are you what? What was your favorite thing to come out of the of the pandemic? Favorite piece of art, whether it's a book or a film or a TV show, what was the thing that kind of got you through and that you could relate to that related maybe a little bit to the way you think and the way you work? Um, I mean, work work itself really pulled me through on some level. You know, I did like there was that that comedy bit that that young woman was doing where, where she would visit herself, like that herself six months later would come and talk to her about the pain. Oh yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was a good one. That was very satisfying to me. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the murder hornets and all. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things that I enjoyed that were produced during during the pandemic and books that I read. And, you know, it's been a very f fertile time, I feel like, for 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 art. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, I f feel like I've, I've had the luxury of being able to really um, absorb my intake versus my output. You know, it's I've had a nice balance of, of refilling the cup, which has been good. Some of the authors and uh, artists I speak to feel exactly the same way you do, and others feel like their whole brain was put on hold for like a year and a half. So it's really interesting. Either people got a lot of stuff done or nothing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there was really no in between um, on either. Um, we do have a question from the audience. Um, was what was the was the general concept of the story developed prior to the pandemic from Emily Hale? Uh, it was, yeah. I probably wrote a year or more on the book before the pandemic. So, so, I mean, the, the pandemic didn't really change or, or add story. Mm -hmm. It needed to be addressed, you know, in, in the sort of historical nature of a book that takes place in the near future needs to address this pandemic that we mm -hmm. appear to be living through for multiple years. But you know, as I said, it was kind of on point for, you know, if we're talking about what made our children so anxious, you know, um, you know, certainly, um, certainly it, it, it played into it. And then, you know, and then I, I, I mean, I did ask my, my publisher what the drop dead date was for making any changes because, mm -hmm. because you, you, you never know what's going to happen in our world. And if some big world event, 
happened that that clearly should have been addressed in the book but wasn't you were going to feel the book was suddenly going to feel out of actually out of sync with reality mm -hmm. um and and luckily we did not have any um horrible world changing events uh between when i finished the book and, and now so um what are you working on now well it's busy um right now you know we're we're writing a bunch of alien scripts to, mm -hmm. to make this show for fx um and um you know it's a big it's a big show and and um you know i he it's gonna cost money and so we really have to write it and budget it and all that sort of stuff so mm -hmm. you know i'm sort of halfway through those those scripts and then we're starting a fargo room um up in um in a month or two um to try to get um what i'm calling a final season written um mm -hmm. and then seeing which which one of these things we can make for we'll make first you know mm -hmm. um and then i have a, a a film um that i'm right that i've written that's at netflix and and um you know, I'm about to turn a draft in and see what if they want to make it or not make it. And then I'm going to have to decide which of these things get made when and, and everything. But so, you know, it's good. I, I, you know, I didn't I wasn't in production last year. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go this year without getting back on a set. And so I'm just trying to figure out where how I could get there the most direct route. Are you giving the I guess, you know, the infamous great movie alien the fargo treatment where you're going to kind of carry over the the feeling and the the kind of it, there's a warmth to it but i i don't i want to say more of a tepidness yeah it's interesting i'm, I'm balancing that out now you know i think i i came to it because you know originally we were we were going to pilot it um, but then it became clear that the pilot was going to be way too expensive that we needed to spread that cost out and so but you know, originally aesthetically, I guess my head was was not was sort of in a hybrid way in in the alien design aesthetic. Um, but I guess I'm gravitating more toward toward the actual feeling there. Mm -hmm. But I mean that that's for better or worse, that's all I can do, right? Which is I can figure out what the movie Fargo made me feel. Mm -hmm. and why it made me feel that and then i can try to recreate that feeling i can't figure out what it made you feel <laughs> when you watched it you know so all i can really do with alien is go oh you know what's really interesting about me about alien is it's it's not just a monster movie it's also a movie about you know the monsters in our past and the and the monsters we've created in our future with artificial intelligence and so there's something in being trapped in the middle of the those two things, it feels like fertile ground for for a show. Um, as someone, I, I'm someone who lived in the Midwestern tundra, and uh, so did my husband. <laughs> He's from there. So the what you were saying for um, for Fargo, it's this idea that every word is slight but like very loaded. Like what you were saying with Jesse Plemons when he walked and he said a word, someone said something else. He took the hand and he left. Right. That's, that was Fargo. That was the original and that was the new one. And it'd be interesting to see an alien, how like it carries over emotionally. Yeah. I mean, what I always loved about both the movie Fargo and the challenge of, of telling those stories is, you know, Fargo is a tragedy based around the idea that people can't communicate with each other. Right. So, <laughs> you know, if, if Bill Macy had ever been able to just say the truth out loud, so much tragedy would have been averted, but but he he literally could not finish a sentence. And so, how do you tell a story when the characters can't express themselves? You know, it's such a fascinating challenge. Well, that's what the Midwest is. You can't say what you're feeling out loud, and that's yeah. And so and so you end up with this you know this Minnesota nice as they as they call it, which is a sort of like this very forcible cheerfulness that seems to be covering some really dark stuff. Oh yeah, um, I went to White Bear Lake. Cool bears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I mean, Alien is a very different thing, but what I really like about, about it 
you know, especially that first movie is, is it's, you know, it's such a working class mm -hmm. story, you know, and you think about, I, I think about like Yafet Kodo and Harry Dean Stanton, you know, mm -hmm. they're in Waiting for Godot, right? They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're in a Beckett play in which, you know, this corporation, they don't know anyone in charge. They're told, they're woken up, they're told to go to this place. You know, it's very Beckett on that, on that level to me, you know, and, and it's very 70s, that first movie. And then the second movie is so 80s, you know, it's, it's really interesting. But even so, it's, you know, you get Paul Reiser, but he was middle management at best, right? So it really is this kind of blue collar um, story um, in which it's, it's always the, the, the management that, that is suspect, you know. <laughs> Well, do you have um, anything else you want to say about your book or about Alien or about anything in general? You're just a very fascinating person. So I'm well, sure people will hear what's on your mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I think I think it's our responsibility as artists to just to try to engage with the world. And, and you know, there's a moment, there's a moment in the book in the middle of the book where I, the author, come in and, and apologize. You know, I say first, you know, I, I want to say that I, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, your author understands that the story he's telling is ridiculous, but what is he supposed to do when the world he lives in becomes ridiculous, you know? And, and, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I am a, a student of a, absurdity, right? Like I make a show called Fargo and, and I understand the Kafka-esque, um, what it means to tell a Kafka-esque story. And, you know, when I look outside and we're talking about alternative facts and, and, and horse dewormers and, you know, and you go, well, how, how am I supposed to tell a serious story about this absurdity, you know, mm -hmm. which is not to say that, that, that the, the response is to make satire, right? Like that's, Satire is is a dead art form, as far as I can tell, because satire requires shame, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't produce shame in someone by mocking them, then mocking them is pointless, right? But we live in this inverted reality where 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 there is no shame anymore. You know, the things that 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 if you if you expose them to the light of, of day that were immoral, you used to be able to produce a feeling of like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I wish you didn't know that. But now we just mm -hmm. live in a world where people are proud of the things that they used to be ashamed of. And so how do you, you know, how do you tell a story about that world? And, and you know, this book was my response to that. And, and you know, I, I've been really interested just to see if people, how critics would react to it or people would react to it. and and you know, whether they would say like, oh, this book is just, just ridiculous, you know. But, you know, it's a book about how I'm worried about my kids and you're worried about your kids and, and you know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help them help them through this? And, and you know, it's, it's been gratifying to see it resonate with, with people. Well, thank you so much. Um, if there are no more questions, um, that's gonna be a wrap on our presentation. Thank you to our guests and to all of you who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of our independent bookstore. Please support us and click on the green purchase button that reads Anthem directly below the viewer screen. Um, it will take you to our website where you can purchase the book online and you can get it signed. Oh, it's already been signed. So get, get one, get one for your friends, you know, buy us out, please. Yes. <laughs> if you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, you just got a comment that said, thank you, Noah. The book is brilliant. It's, it was a pleasure from Emily Hill. Wonderful. Okay. Um, have a great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.